Thank you, Maria. Hi, uh, my name is Nikki. I'm an alcoholic. Um, so like Maria said, um, she uh, watched, I think she might have been at, if not my first, then definitely my second meeting. Um, and uh, so I got sober in uh, on April 13th, I think it was, um, 2016. So I have a little over three years, about three and a half years almost. Um, so I, I said I was an alcoholic, right? So um, I, uh, I am. And uh, so I'm a little nervous sharing time. I haven't shared in a long time. So um, I'm going to tell you what happened, you know, what it was like, or yeah. But uh, first, I just want to explain like, like where I'm at why this is so strange for me, but also like that's kind of part of the awesomeness. So um, a year ago, I moved away from St. Louis and came here to St. Kitts, which is like a tiny island in the Caribbean, um, a little bit south of Puerto Rico. And um, I did that to go to medical school. So um, the AA down here has been a lot different than what I'm used to. And um, I recently started like really like needing meetings, you know, because like the few people that were coming like kind of filtered off. And um, so I found some online meetings and I wandered into this meeting and saw three people that I was, I think it was three, maybe it was just two, but three people at least that I knew from St. Louis and it was so exciting. And I was like, oh, this is like meant to be. So Matt Ash actually asked me to speak a couple weeks ago. And um, Matt has been around since the very beginning that I got sober too. And, um, and then he had missed, missed up his dates and he was like, no, actually do it September 30th. And I said, okay, you know, and I didn't even think of what that date was. So I have finals in a, in a week. So I'm like a little scatterbrained and crazy, but something else is going on that I want to share before I like share my story story. And that is that, um, I am trying to quit smoking. <laughs> And so I'm like, um, not doing a great job, but I'm doing okay. And, uh, I'm just a little scatterbrained. So if I look like I'm a crazy person, it's because it's finals week of medical school and I'm two days off the jewel, four weeks off cigarettes. So just let me preface all of that. Okay. All of these are things that are wonderful problems and I'm super grateful for them. Okay. So let me tell you. Um, so I'll just briefly go into how I drank. So I started, um, uh, I grew up in a small town, central Missouri, two hours west of St. Louis, and um, two alcoholic parents who divorced when I was young. Um, and, um, well, my mom may not be an alcoholic. My dad will tell you he is, um, both still practicing, and my mom's mother is an alcoholic. So, I can't, you know, I can't buy it honestly. Um, that In our family, um, if you were sad, you drank. If you were happy, you drank. Um, and it was cute for me to drink, you know, because I was like 11 or 12. So people would like sneak a little vodka in my water. They'd let me have mimosas on Christmas morning, blah, blah, blah. So I thought drinking was really cool. And um, when I turned 13, I got like very teenager all of a sudden and was like um, a super middle child. And like I was very selfish and I wasn't getting the attention that I thought I deserved as a 13 year old teenager because I had an older sister who um, just had a child. And then I also had um, little sisters who were infants. Like, um, so I had like, my older sister had a, like a newborn and then I had like these two year old little sisters that, that were twins at home. And like my dad was, um, had like a new girlfriend who had like another daughter that was almost my age. And like, I was just like, nobody's paying attention to me. So I took advantage of that and started sneaking out of the house and, um, got blackout drunk with the people in the neighborhood. And that was my first, like, I can't remember my first drink, but I know my very first blackout drunk. Um, and there were consequences for my actions from the very beginning. Um, I got, blackout drunk and stayed out until 3 a.m. the night before cheerleading camp. And I was captain of my cheerleading squad in junior high, which was a big deal to me, you know? And um, I did a lot of things that I would definitely not have done had I been sober. Um, and the kinds of things that if my little sisters told me that they were doing that at 13, I would like have to go commit murder. <laughs> you know what I mean? So like suffice to say, it was just like a lot of consequences, a lot of not great things going on. And um, I drank like that through high school um, as a coping mechanism for whatever I thought wasn't going right in my life. Um, but I was a really driven person. So I worked really hard in high school and I kind of picked up some drugs along the way. They are a small part of my story that helped me to maintain a very 
driven lifestyle <laughs> along with my drinking. And then um, I went to college in St. Louis. So I moved to St. Louis in 2008. And I left all of the trauma and everything I thought behind me. And I went to college. And when I got there, um, I didn't have to work. I had like no car and I just lived on campus. And I was like, you know, starting this whole new chapter. And I broke up with my high school boyfriend. And I thought, you know, like, this is going to be good. And I went to college parties and everybody else was drinking. So like for the first time, it like, I didn't really have to control my drinking anymore because everybody else was drinking like this too, I thought. <laughs> but turns out um, my friend group got smaller and smaller and smaller, even though I joined like a sorority and I was in all these clubs, but I only had like three or four other people that drank like me that drank an entire bottle of UV glue. And we're at the fraternity houses four nights a week in the bar at age 18, <laughs> you know, the fifth night. Like, um, Yeah, so by the end of my freshman year, I was like, all the stereotypes that you can possibly think of um, of, a, of a Delta Zeta. That's what it was, in case you want to know. <laughs> so um, it was pretty cool. Um, I thought it was, you know. And then um, I started getting physical consequences that year where, like, um, I, uh, I thought I had, like, IBS, you know. But, like, and then um, I went and had, like, really bad anxiety. And I went and saw a nurse practitioner who put me on medicine. And then when I would drink with it, it made me a hot mess. So then I quit taking it. And so that story of me knowing something's wrong, going and getting help, drinking on the medicine, that repeated itself for about another five to six years. Um, I graduated college with terrible grades um, and a lot of debt, um, both uh, credit card and, and student. And it was a lot to do with my rock star lifestyle because when I got my student loan refund check, it didn't go into savings. It went for Molly and to the strip club, <laughs> you know, like it was just totally inappropriate for 20 year olds to do. I don't know, unless that's what you're into, but not what I should have been doing. Anyway, so that's what happened. Um, I had a series of bad relationships. I alienated myself for my family. I'm sure most of you can relate to that kind of story. I ended up getting a job out of um, college and getting a little small apartment right across the street from my favorite bar um, where I knew the landlord and um, he would buy me shots when I came over to pay rent, stuff like that. Um, and so it was like comfortable, but it was kind of like sad um, in retrospect. And so, um, I started like, I would drink every night at the bar and like I knew I was an alcoholic. So I would always say things like, oh, I can't keep cookies or booze in the house because they'll be gone, you know? So I would just go drink at the bar and I drank there so often it was like pretty cheap um, for me. And that's what I did. And then I, you know, had to be at work at 7.30 and I wouldn't make it till eight. And then I had to be at work at 7.30 and I wouldn't make it till 8.30. And then one morning, um, it was a Saturday morning and we have a short, we had a small, small work crew on Saturday mornings and um, I had decided to go to Oktoberfest the night before and dropped my phone into my staircase, which is like a wooden staircase and I couldn't find it so I didn't have an alarm and I didn't get up and I didn't go to work. So I got put on probation, I should have been fired. And then um, three months later, I decided to do basically the same thing, went out drinking and was supposed to be at work and woke up and it was 9.30. And so I was like, well, I don't know what to do. So I just like put my clothes on, and drove there and I got into the parking lot and I was like, I know I'm gonna lose this job, you know? And I was like, I was in so much debt. I had like payday loans, like I was just a hot mess. And um, my dad had already bailed me out financially once so we weren't super close, so that was like a big deal for him to do that. And I was just like, I'm gonna lose my job. You know, like there's literally nothing keeping me going at this point. I had no good friends. Um, you know, like the guys I dated were just drug dealers that I was using for, you know, whatever company and um, to get what I needed and free drinks and stuff and nothing was, you know, I had lost friends. Like one of my best friends from college, she had come to see me and introduced her new fiance to me. And I haven't spoken to her since that night. Um, because I don't know what I did. And I, you know, I was so scared to ask her what I did because she never talked to me again after that night. And I have no idea. I don't know if she was just like went home and I just don't remember saying goodbye. I don't know if I said something to her fiance. I have no idea. But anyway, she just got married and no, I wasn't invited to the wedding, you know? So like um, stuff like that, you just kind of, you know, you work on oh, through the program. But anyway, so that's just like a snapshot of what was going on. That all sounds super depressing. So what had happened was I was like, I want to not live this life anymore. And uh, I was in the parking lot and I was crying and I was like, let me, you know, I called the one person who thought I might still answer. It was my older sister. Thankfully, she's a nurse. So although she was pretty sick of my bullshit from a family friend standpoint, her nursing kind of kicked in and she was like, well, maybe you should try like an AA meeting. Like, go get yourself some help. Go to rehab. Do something. And I was like, well, I can't go to rehab. I don't have any money. So I went into work and 
um, with the promise for my sister that I would go to an AME event, right? And I went into work and they didn't fire me. Um, and then I uh, got off work and took a nap and then woke up too late for the meeting I wanted to go to, went to another meeting, couldn't find it because it was in the VA hospital. And then the last meeting of the night was at 8.30, which is a weird time for a meeting because most meetings are five or six. And it was at a church for the deaf. So I was like, this is a deaf meeting. Like, but I told my sister I would go. This is the last one of the night before like midnight. And I have to go to this. So I walked into the parking lot, completely expecting it to be a meeting for deaf people. And I walk up to the door and there's like all these cool people <laughs> standing outside, like smiling. They're like super cute and nice. And they were like, hi. And it was like, um, it was, it was Steve remember Steve and yeah but he was like he was like exuberant like it, okay three years ago he was like and I think that was one of his runs where he actually had like three months but anyway and then um Sydney who was like awesome she had like six months more than me at the time and like Jesse L and oh I guess it's Jesse K but you know who I mean and um I don't know it was just crazy and I walked into the meeting and everybody was so nice to me that I was like overwhelmed because I was like leaking booze out of my pores and like puffing face from crying and everyone was so nice and they were like oh we have another meeting tomorrow and I was like okay so I like left and I came back to the same meeting it was like a different time and someone was like do you have a sponsor and I was like what is that and and she was like oh it's just someone that helps you do the steps and I was like great will you do it <laughs> she was like yes and um anyway so I got a copy of the big book for free and I started reading it because I didn't know what else to do and I just started reading the first one 64 I did almost everything my sponsor told me to do um and you know she fired me pretty promptly um but both of us are still sober today so like I'm not really mad about it um I think you know I, I was the first person she had sponsored and so it was just like I don't know. It was, it was fine. We're both still sober, which is what counts, you know? And, <laughs> um, so, uh, I got a new sponsor, um, because I wanted someone that had something that I didn't have, which was a lot of friends. So I started going to this new women's meeting on Tuesday and I met this lady who had like all these friends and I was like, that's what I want. You know, I want people to like me. I want to walk into a room and laugh, you know? And so she did, she agreed to sponsor me and she um, took me through the steps and we completed all 12 steps. Um, I was able to make amends to some people in my family. And um, anyway, it was, it was wonderful. Um, my brother-in-law was like, he's like a total jack munch and has like called me the C word and like, 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 you know, like we didn't get, you know, we just didn't get along. Like he like stole, like he stole my weed when I was like 16. And like, I just, I don't know, like we've never gotten along. And, um, I don't know. I told him like why I decided to get sober and what had happened and everything. And, and like, that was like one of the first amends I made and it really stuck out to me because I expected him to be like, all right, you fucking dork. Like why, why do I care? And what he said instead it was Nikki, I had no idea it was like that. I care about you. And if I would have known that you were struggling so hard, I would have let you move in with me and your sister. You know what I mean? Like he didn't say you suck and I can't believe you did all this stuff. And you did this when you were in Vegas with my wife and like all this stuff, what he said was, I care about you and I'm glad you're doing better. And that's pretty much how all my amends have gone. Like, um, I know I'm skipping over a lot of stuff It's because I'm talking too long. So um, I'm sorry that I'm not going through all the steps. If you're new, ask someone about the steps. We do not skip to step nine in most stories. I just, uh, there's a lot of stuff that has to happen before we make amends so that it's not so scary when you get to it. Um, anyway, but then like I made amends with like this woman that, um, oh, I used to like go into the office or office every week. And like I told her to her face, I was like, I don't like your laugh everything about you annoys me. Like I really hated this person and like I was able to call her and make an amends. And now like she writes on, you know, it's like a stupid, it's like a little thing, but she writes on my Facebook page on my birthday. She's like, I'm so proud of you. You're going to be such a good doctor. Like, it's just like the relationships and the way that they change because of this program is like awesome. Anyway. So I, a lot of things happened. I, got into medical school, which is what I really always wanted to do, but couldn't do it because I couldn't stay sober enough to like chase my dreams. Um, I'm still single, ready to mingle, but that's fine because I'm on my way to having a wonderful career. And um, I have a wonderful relationship with my mom and my family. And um, 
my best friend's about to have a little baby, and so I'm going to be an aunt again. And um, I don't know. I just I just love this program so much, and I have so much to be grateful for. Um, and I have a different spot. Like, so I've, I was going to tell you my whole thing about all these sponsors I went through, but the point is, find someone who has something you want. And if you decide that you don't want what they have anymore, or you want something else, it's always okay to switch. So don't be afraid to switch sponsors, because every time I've switched sponsors, it's been like, oh, but I really like this sponsor, but I have to go switch for this reason, and then I get it, and I'm like, oh, I really like this person. <sighs> okay, so, um, yeah. So anyway, I, um, yeah, I just finished my first year of medical school. Um, I have sponsored women in the program, which is really hard. I've never gotten anyone past the third step, but um, I'm hoping someday I will be able to do that. Um, but the point is, I'm still sober. <laughs> so not to be selfish, but I am. You know, um, something that I like to share in my story, because like, I just don't think it's that common. Um, is that like when I tell you that I went to an AA meeting because someone told me to, and then I started working the steps, like I never drank again after that. And it's not, you know, like it's not that I, um, I don't know, it's just relapse is a part of many people's stories. And the thing is, like before I tried AA, yeah, of course I tried to quit drinking and then stop. So maybe I just did my relapses before I actually came in the program. But since I got desperate and hit rock bottom and didn't want to live the life I was living anymore, and became like a child, like ready to just listen to whatever anybody had to tell me and do things, you know, even when it seemed like nuts, you know, like I was like, that doesn't seem like something that I really want to do, but you guys are all still sober and like you like each other. So like, I'm going to keep doing what you're doing, you know, until it makes sense. And then it does. And, um, you know, um, like I said, it's, um, where I, where I got sober was a beautiful community. I got really involved in service. Um, I did stuff in my home group, and then I also did um, the Young People's Conference, Missouri State Conference of Young People's in AA, which is where I met Maria and Matt, and um, uh, wasn't there someone else? I guess Mike's just from St. Louis, but was there someone else that was on the committee too? Or am I crazy? Okay, anyway, um, yeah, and it was like, awesome and like some of those people that I that I like were, worked on that conference with like I still know to this day like I could pick up the phone at any time of day or night and just be like hey what's up you know like I feel like Maria's like that like Paige like you know just like any of these people like you just build this bond and it's like when we all stayed sober and played kickball and did all these things together that I never would have dreamed of doing you know um, it was really beautiful so sobriety can be beautiful amazing things happen sometimes it's really hard um, it is not always easy, but that doesn't mean you have to drink over it and you do not have to relapse. Um, but if you do just come back and you do not have to go to treatment. Some people just go to AA and that's okay. Whatever, however you brings you here, whether it's your parole officer or your big sister or whatever, we're glad you're here. I'm glad you're here because you guys keep me sane. Thank you so much. That's it. Woo.